Good morning. I think it's still morning. Wow. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you something. How many of you want all students that come out of our school systems to be happy? Yes. Yes. Successful? Yes. Content? Yes. Good at reading and writing? Math? How about scientific reasoning and thinking? deductively and inductively about things. We do. And not only do we need that, we need our students to think. We need them to think, to solve the world's greatest problems. In fact, not only do we need them to think and meet our expectations, they need to go beyond expectations. At our manufacturing company here in the Poconos, human resources rates their employees. Even the workers on the factory floor will not get promoted unless they exceed expectations, not meet expectations. We live in a different world. So our question could be was, how do we get there? How do we get there to have young people grow up to exceed expectations? Well, you're right, and probably you're thinking about it, right? How do we do that? Their home, their mom, their dad, their family. Well, it's also their teacher. Because research has shown back in the 90s, and even now has been supported by the Gates Foundation, that the teacher is the most influential person in a student's achievement. It's the teacher. Yes. And the Gates Foundation went further on to show that not only is it the teacher, but the teacher that has particular characteristics. So they looked at students who scored in the 75th percentile in their standardized test. And they surveyed those children across a gamut of ages. And 76% of them said that my teacher cares about me. We forgot to ask the teachers what makes a great teacher. So I did, um, because I was curious. So I went to a bunch of schools. I went to five different schools. And I asked the principals for some fantastic teachers people that I would admire, because I was a teacher myself, just so you know, as you know. And it's a very tiny study. Seven teachers from five different schools, public, private, boarding, and also charter. And the public schools represented both city and rural. And these teachers were from different environments, totally. But they had extraordinary things in common. And what they had in common was actually corroborated by research. So they had awareness. We've talked a lot about awareness already today, awareness of the system. Well, you might know, you may not, that in 1852 to 1917, compulsory education was coming through in the United States. But at that time, all these different schools were doing so many different things. So right in the middle of that time, in 1892, the Committee of Ten was formed to standardize curriculum to say, you know what, what is a high school diploma? What does it actually mean if all these people are doing all these different things? And this group was put together by the NEA, by the way. But it was a bunch of university professors and commissioners of education, and it was a bunch of men, quite frankly, that don't look like me. <laughs> Um, they don't represent me, and also it was at a time where the automobile was just coming along. It wasn't really functional for people at the time, let alone computers. See, you see, sometimes we make decisions and we perform actions based on information that is now obsolete. That reminds me a little bit of what we're doing now in education. We're making decisions and we're performing actions based on what is obsolete. So as a result, we handcuff our teachers. We handcuff them. How do we handcuff them? We handcuff them because we know, we know that people learn at different times in a different way. We teach people as if they all learn at the same time. I was told when I was in third grade that I would never learn how to ski by a ski instructor. When I was in sixth grade, I could ski. Okay. But to teachers, we don't do that. We tell teachers they have 40 minutes a day to teach all their kids, and they get these lovely pacing guides, and, say, and we tell the teachers, oh, guess what? If your kid's not on that level, it's your fault. Hurry up. 
teaching better. Try this strategy. We have another obstacle, and we all have the same obstacle. You do, I do, and most of us do. And that is that we have a personal experience. It has been modeled for us what a teacher is supposed to be, what I'm doing now. We're supposed to be lecturing. And we spent over 2,000 days watching that model that we've internalized as what something is supposed to be. Do you know that they say it takes 68 days to form a new habit? That's on average. We've spent over 2,000 in the old model. How hard is it going to be to break that model? It's hard. So we have a mismatch. The mismatch is between what, how learning occurs and what our system of learning does to our students. Sorry, we have a lot of teacher frustration. A lot of it. In fact, we have a ton of teacher attrition as well. In fact, 40% of our first year teachers either leave their job or they move and go to a new school district. And do you know that winds up costing the United States over $2 billion? Just that movement. In 2014, we got a little bit of wake-up call to Stacy Starr, who was rated Teacher of the Year a year before in Ohio, decided to quit teaching. She was Teacher of the Year. She said, I can't drill them and kill them anymore. She taught special needs students. They didn't learn at the same time or in the same way. And she was about to make them try. She couldn't do it anymore. And Stacy Starr noted something when she was leaving. She said, it's not somebody's fault. And this is what she said, God bless her. It's not the teacher's fault. It is not the principal's fault. She didn't blame her administrators. It's our system. Because our system was predicated and built upon different understandings of learning than we have now. But we all now need to be part of that solution. So how do we do that? How are we part of the solution? Well. We need to change, and we need to think of our teachers as co-designers, that group that we never asked how we could modify education. But you see, it's not just teachers as the designers. You see, there are certain particular characteristics that those key teachers have in common, these fantastic teachers. And you know what? It's actually a little bit humbling, and those are going to be shared with you. So let's first look, why do teachers have to be designers? Because when you are a designer, you take ownership, not only of the road and the destination, but how you get there. In fact, we know that your brain reads actually increase when you are designing something or when you make a decision about something. They did this awesome experiment where they gave a bunch of people a task and you had to do it. So the people did it. And their brain was going around. But when they gave just a simple choice, you could do this or this, do you know there was increased brain activity? We know that. Here's this one for a comic. Have you guys all seen it before? It's a good one. For a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. And that is based on the quote from Einstein who says, everyone is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. What we do to kids right now is identity theft. We judge them by a number. It's the biggest identity theft we have going. Kids are more than a number. And guess what? So are our teachers. So what does this mean in the modern age? Well, in the modern age, there's so many ways. There's collaborative learning, there's gamification, there's customization, there's mixed groups. We have the Montessori approach that's been around for ages. But a lot of this for scaling up means you have to use technology. If you want to scale this up and you have, you have the ratio of students to teachers that we have, you need to use technology. So how do we do that? We have to try and try and try. And we have to fail and we have to fail fast. So instead of when we try something, chaos might be produced because you try something and it might fail. So teachers have this control button, right, where they have to control things and keep things calm and we don't want to get too crazy. And so we try to keep things under wraps. So it's much easier to have the whole class doing the same activity, okay, 
and everybody's focused in on that. And it's harder to have different students doing a lot of different things. That's hard because that means you don't have as much control. It's much easier to be up in front of the room and talking because everybody's looking at you. And actually, it can make you feel good too because everyone's listening to you. In fact, one of the teacher, fantastic teachers I interviewed said this, you know what, teachers like to stand in front of the room and talk because they want to feel good about themselves because they like to look down at everybody else and, and think their students feel stupid, okay? That's why he felt that other teachers didn't try things. But it's hard to do this, where your teachers might now be an authority and they're now directing things. And they might ask you questions that you don't know the answers to, and so you're all looking them up. So most people think when you're experimenting, you win or you fail. And this is very common, by the way, in public education. What will happen is, or in, or in private education, uh, a group gets some math curriculum and they try it the entire year. The curriculum either wins or it fails. But you've, you've done that curriculum with them the entire year. But you see, it's really not like that. You have to fail, 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 fail fast, and then eventually you'll win. Um, Jack Matson said, your propensity for success is based on your threshold for failure. Jack Matson, he was the author of the book Innovator Die, and he believes in intelligent fast failure. Intelligent fast failure is to move as quickly as possible from new ideas to knowledge by making small and manageable mistakes, not huge ones that are going to wind up affecting our kids because we don't want them, we don't want to fail too much, right? Because if we fail too much, it's affecting a child. It's affecting their learning. So how do we harness this? This is something that has to be researched further. One of the things that we know that a teacher has to have is a growth mindset. And we know that because when they have a growth mindset, they're trying new things. There's one principal who says, I want to see teachers fail. I want to see them fail when he's observing them. I want to see how they're going to pick up. He wants to see a growth mindset. So for this growth mindset, one of the things that I think is key from these teachers, these fantastic teachers that I interviewed, is that they collaborate together. Collaboration is hugely important because we have this very exhausting thing about human nature. And that is that the reassuring lie is much easier than the inconvenient truth in our brains. The other aspect is teachers can plan together. Um, in Japan, lesson study is very common, where teachers all would, would go around and work on the same lesson, they'll then branch out, do the lesson, and come back and think about what worked well and what didn't work well. However, just so you know, that lesson study method came from the United States. <laughs> okay. um, so in it, we just don't do that much, too much anymore. So what we need is, we need professionals. We need professional teachers. I mean, what do you mean we need professional teachers? Well, teachers are different, okay? Some teachers like chaos, some teachers like order, some teachers like doing different things. And different teachers have different gifts. <laughs> when I was a, a teacher here in, in Strasbourg, um, some people used to say to me, hey Beth, you're a good teacher. And I'd be like, uh, no, I'm a good thief. I go around and I watch everybody else with eyes and I see what they're doing is good, and I steal it from them. And now as a professor, I do the same thing with my, my colleagues, my professors that are peers, and my colleagues that are my students. They give me great ideas on how to improve. And so we can't expect all teachers to be able to do everything equally well. Teachers need to learn from each other. We have to humble ourselves and say, you know what, I don't do this so well. And another teacher has to come out and say, you know what, I can do this. Here are my ideas. Um, again, in my study, uh, there was a, um, a gentleman and he said, you know what, I don't think I'm good half the time, but I have this other one that I work with and she encourages me. And she tells me how I need to improve. And, and you know what, I interviewed her separately and she said the same thing about him. 
It went both ways. So if we continue as business as usual, we're going to come to a dead end. Because no matter how shiny and how much glitch and how much technology that we put into our systematic way of doing things, we know that people don't learn at the same way at the same time, so we're going to get to a dead end. Oh, we might raise our test scores a few percentage points, but it's not going to get us to where we want to go. But we have this opportunity for what we know about learning. We have an opportunity because we know that people have different kinds of intelligence and we have different ways. And it's not if you are intelligent, it's about how are you intelligent? How can we nurture that from, with each student? Maya Angelou has a saying, we delight in the beauty of a butterfly, but we rarely admit the changes it has to have gone through to achieve that beauty. Are we willing to make that change? You know, a butterfly that goes into its chrysalis and you try to help it out of its chrysalis and make things easy for it, it actually won't work because it has to push that fluid from the inside of its abdomen out to create those wings. So that butterfly has to do it. We have to empower our teachers. So we have to reboot. Reboot in the 1990s, when we kind of had computers and we were all getting them, meant that you turned off your computer, you turned it back on, no big deal. But rebooting means something different today. Rebooting means there was probably an update, but I have my computer right now. It probably means that that update's going to have to run. And after that update runs, your computer's going to come back up, and it might be unrecognizable. And you might get really frustrated, but you're aware that that update is going to happen. And then you're going to have to experiment with that update and find out what works and what doesn't. And you're going to try to do it fast because you want to get to your task about whatever that next task is. So you're going to have to experiment. And you're going to have to collaborate with others because you're going to find out what works. And that's why we have young people, by the way, so they can tell us how to work our computers. Okay. And then we're going to work together to make all those things work. If we want to be successful and not base our education on past ideas that are obsolete, we have got to reboot our teachers as designers. Thank you.